love dinosaur movies. That's from Jurassic Park. And uh, as you know, there was a sequel to that, Jurassic World, which was released a few weeks ago. It has made <clears throat> all the money, and, uh, and it was a huge success. Jurassic Park, though, when it was released, was an interesting and slightly different film than Jurassic World. It deals with a philosophical concept that is really fascinating to delve into. Jurassic World, not so much a lot of teeth and death and fun, but if you like teeth and death. But Jurassic Park uh, dealt with this idea... Uh, this ancient Greek idea of hubris. Right now, I was a former English teacher, and so I would teach my students about English and about hubris, and the Greeks loved this idea of hubris. Here's the definition of hubris. It's excessive pride or defiance leading to a tragic downfall. And Jurassic Park kind of explored this idea. What happens when people, when humanity, gets a little too big for our britches, where we start to control things we got no business controlling, and we try to think that we're in control of everything but in reality, we can't control everything. That's what hubris is. And of course, it leads to the destruction of many characters, including a lawyer on the toilet eaten by a T-Rex. And I think we can all agree, as Americans, that what movies need more of, we need more evil lawyers being eaten by T-Rexes on toilets. That's just what we need as a people group, I think, in general. That's fantastic. Evil lawyers getting eaten by T-Rexes on toilets. That's, in ge that's my platform. To help America. Anyway, we're uh, so hubris. Let me talk about hubris a little bit because it's this really fascinating idea. The Greeks really love to toy, toy with it. It's this idea that sometimes humans have too high a view of themselves. And, and if you think about it, some of the most famous characters in cinema and in filmography have centered around this theme of hubris, which is excessive pride that leads inevitably to some tragic downfall. If you think about it, uh, some of the most famous characters in, in movies, there's uh, Walter White, of course, who tries to control everything, and it spirals out of his control from the television series Breaking Bad. There's Scarface. Of course, everything goes right down the toilet with him. And then, of course, even Colonel Nathan Jessup, right? Uh, did you order the code red? You can't handle the truth, right? That's what, th this is, these are men who deal with the concept of hubris, trying to control everything, thinking they're more powerful than they are, and it always leads to an inevitable, tragic downfall for these characters, because that's what the Greeks are trying to say. If you think too high of yourself, it will end badly. But it's not just literature. Oh no, oh no. Lest you think that it's simply literature or stories of human invention in which excessive pride that leads to downfall happens. We have real life examples in our world. A couple of years ago, the Niners were really good. <clears throat> Not anymore. They are really, and they made it to the NFC Championship game, if you recall, against the their, their arch nemesis, the Seattle Seahawks, and it was a bloodbath. The, 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 the whole game, it was just terrible. It was just uh, people dying on the field. It was broken legs. It was crazy. And so at the end of that game, uh, the Niners had a chance to win, and they had a pass to uh, their primary wide receiver. And the, 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 the Seattle Seahawks' top corner, a guy by the name of Richard Sherman, tipped the ball. It was intercepted. The game was over. And right after that came one of the most incredible sports interviews in the history of sports interviews. We're going to play it just as a point of reference. Let's take a look. Let's send him out of the field and get Aaron Edwards. Joe, thank you so much. Richard, let me ask you the final play. Take me through it. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're going to get. Don't you ever talk about me. Who was talking about you? Crabtree, don't you open your mouth about the best. Are you on the set for you real quick? L.O.B. All right, before... And Joe, back over to you. All right, well, we saw... Oh, that's glorious. That is fantastic. Who, who is talking about you? I love it. I, Aaron Andrews, fantastic. Now, we can all agree, right, and, you know, that, that is, that, that's arrogance, that's pride, right, that's hubris. That we can all kind of see this, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, this morning. And of course, that is pride, that is hubris, that is, um, that is arrogance. But if that's all that our definition of pride encompasses, then unfortunately, we've set our bar so low, um, or I guess high, that um, we're all safe. Because unless you make a game-winning 
athletic feat and then boast about it braggadociously in front of a national TV audience of 60 million, then you're safe. And uh, apparently only a few of us in this room could probably even accomplish that. <clears throat> so, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a, a story where Jesus is kind of going after that attitude, but you're going to see a little bit more that Jesus doesn't just go after that attitude. Jesus is going after something much, much more. Now, there's this moment in Luke 18 where Jesus actually encounters people who have the kind of spiritual braggadociousness of Richard Sherman. They are arrogant, they are cruel, and actually Luke begins the story by even setting up the story saying, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. It's as though Luke is saying, hey, there was this group, and they were kind of like Richard Sherman, and Jesus went after them this way. This is what Jesus says. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, let me pause here, a little cultural context. I know this is difficult to believe, but people who took taxes from common people for the government were not liked in the ancient world. I know, tough to imagine, tough to imagine. They weren't only just taking people's money. Of course, they were agents of Rome, this evil, oppressive empire that had held Israel under its thumb for a generation. So it wasn't just that. They were also traitors to their own people, religious traitors, political traitors, traitors of all sorts. So Jesus is making a point here. Religious leader and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you. I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus says this, drops the mic. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. These are Jesus' words. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. You've got two options, humble yourself or humiliation. P Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter. He says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, I don't know about you, but it would be nice in my life if the maker of heaven and earth were not opposed to me. If God opposes, this is the kind of attitude, Peter says, where God says, uh-oh, uh uh-oh, hmm, I'm going to go after that person with my nukes. I don't want to be that person. If God opposes somebody, that's probably not going to end for that somebody, right? So it probably shouldn't be me. God opposes the proud. Ah, uh, okay, so maybe we should take a look at that. Jesus puts it in this perspective. He says, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. Now, again, if we're like Richard, well, that's for people like Richard Sherman, right? That's what that is. But again, let's talk about this. If you're arrogant, if you're braggadocious, if you struggle with this, this is, I've, I've made a, a, a nifty diagram to help explain where the thought processes are for people who are proud. Here it is. This is, this is, <clears throat> so there it is. If you're arrogant, where are your thoughts? Where are your thoughts? On yourself. You. Right? This is the danger of pride. This is the danger of hubris. This is the danger of this kind of thing. But I'm going to point this out. To having too high a view of yourself is one manifestation of this. But ironically and weirdly enough, having too low a view of yourself has the same net effect. If you are incredibly insecure and have incredibly low self-esteem, you also will think of yourself all the time. It has the same net effect. So perhaps, looking at this, let me show you an example in a second, but thinking too highly of yourself has the same net effect as thinking too lowly of yourself. In the end, you're both preoccupied with who? yourself. Weird, but true. There's a, a, another moment in Luke 8. This is not a story that Jesus told, but a story that Jesus lived. He's on his way to a blockbuster miracle. A religious leader whose name is Jairus has a daughter who's 12 who's dying, and he is coming to Jesus 
asking for help. This is a big deal because the religious leaders are actually asking for Jesus' help, saying you could probably help. This is a big deal. And in the middle of this, in Luke 8, this is what happened. Now, when Jesus returned... Um, but, 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 uh, hold on, let me, let me get to it. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the ed- edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. But they all denied it. And Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. It's like Peter saying, we're in a crowd. There's lots of people touching you, Jesus. That's what crowds are. But Jesus said, no, no, no. Someone touched me. I know that the power has gone out from me. He pauses in the middle of this busy moment, getting to this, this, this miracle. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at his feet and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, we don't have a whole lot of information. This is not the only time in the scriptures the story is shared. There's other instances. I'm I'm not going to try to do too much pop psychology on this woman, but we know from other instances that she did not want um, to, to be noticed. She believed that there was this prophet named Malachi, and he had said that when the Messiah comes, the Son of God, the one who is the embodiment of God himself on this earth, the Messiah, the Savior comes, he will rise with healing in his zitzi, in his wings, in the edge of his garment of his cloaks. And so she thought, if I could just touch the edge of his wing, the edge of his cloak, then I'll be healed because I believe that Malachi is being literal here, that healing will come from this man this Messiah. And so she believes it and she touches and then she kind of tries to slink away. And in the middle of this, Jesus kind of stops everything and calls her out. He says, wait, 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 who touched me? And she doesn't want to come forward. And in fact, she doesn't want, she doesn't want to do this. She doesn't want to have a conversation. She does not address Jesus. She does not ask for anything. She does not address him or make a request. In fact, when Jesus stops and says, hey, 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 it's only when she realizes she can't get away that she sheepishly, with trembling, comes forward and makes her case. I guess you could say, that she didn't really feel worthy to make a direct request. For whatever reason she didn't, I don't know what exactly it was. But again, thinking too lowly of yourself has the same effect as thinking too highly of yourself. Who are you thinking about the entire time? Yourself. Notice Jesus' response. Daughter! Daughter! Not servant, not lowly commoner, not one who is ill-prepared or ill-fitting for a relationship with the Messiah. Daughter, your faith, your right theology has healed you. Go in peace with God, knowing that you're right. Daughter, daughter, your thoughts to yourself are all messed up. Daughter, who would deign to wake up a king in the middle of the night asking for a cup of water? No one in the kingdom save one, his child. This is what Jesus is saying. Daughter, daughter of God, daughter. There's a corrective. So if pride, again, what's her thoughts? Her thoughts are this, the same thing. People who have too low self-esteem, the same net effect, too much thought on yourself. So if pride is too high of you of yourself, and if pride is also too low of you of yourself, then perhaps pride correctly understood could be this, just thinking about yourself too much. Because if you are thinking about yourself all the time, if you are constantly thinking about yourself, then who are you not thinking about? Right? Where is the Lord? Is the Lord in your thoughts? Does the Lord have any of your attention? Does he have your time, your dreams, your thoughts, your goals, your heart, your wishes, your dreams, your desires? Is there room? Or are those mostly centered around you? What you want, what you dream, what you desire. There's this moment in Deuteronomy, uh, or again, early in the story of the people of God, where Moses pleads with the Israelites. He pleads with the Hebrew people who have been led out of captivity with all the miracles, 
with God's provision in his hand, in his deliverance, in his salvation. He's led them through the Red Sea. He's going to lead them to the promised land. And Moses is pleading with the people. He's pleading with them. And this is what he says. And I want to read this slowly because this has so much to apply to us. Moses writes this. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the fields. These images are a land of plenty. And when you have eaten, and this is Moses Praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Moses is pleading, don't forget. Don't forget. Because the tendency with comfort and with provision and living in a land of plenty is that you will forget. And not forget, obviously, they're going to remember the stories, but they'll forget, meaning it won't be in the center of their hearts. It won't be in the center of of their dreams, their wishes, their goals, their desires, everything that motivates them. God will be relegated to second or third or fourth or tenth place instead of being the center. You will forget. You'll forget. Let me show you some examples about how this idea of pride resonates all the way from the beginning of the Bible all the way through. Um, I'm going to show you two examples. I'm going to show they're bad examples. I'm going to show you a good example. Let's start with um, Genesis three and Adam and Eve, right? The opening story of creation and then creation of mankind. Okay, so the serpent, the tempter, comes to Eve. And the reason I've chosen this example mostly is because it's a woman. A lot of people think, oh, pride—that's a guy thing, and arrogance. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist. Maybe pride and arrogance is a male thing. But I'm going to show you that this idea of not putting God at the center of your thoughts and putting yourself at the center of your thoughts is certainly not a gender thing. It's a human thing. So in the middle of this, the serpent, the tempter, comes and says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, again, I'm not going to make you diagram the sentence, but this sentence has kind of two subjects. The main one, did God really say to you participle phrase right so there's kind of these two subjects god and you now look at eve's response well well, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden but god did say you must not eat from any tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die again where's your focus starting to be on it's a subtle shift right did god really say to you well we and you and then the serpent says this Next slide. You will, oh, there's a knot missing. You will not certainly die, said the serpent, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, God's in the sentence, but it's twisted a little bit. No, 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 no. God's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to become what you could have in you and you. And then the tragedy, the epic tragic fail that the Bible opens with is this. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, my question is, where's the blue? Where's God? Gone. He's not even in the sentence. And, of course, the great tragedy of all this would be if Eve were just to say, time out, time out, time out, time out. Listen, serpent, you make some great points. Love the tongue. I think you look great on my feet. But the point is, let me go ask God what he thinks. Find out his opinion, his heart, his thoughts on this, and then we'll get back to you. If he says it's cool, we'll totally eat. Or if Adam 
her helpmate, were to come in and say, time out, time out, Eve, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know this does sound good, but let's go ask God. Let's just go to him and ask him, and if he says it's cool, we'll go. Let's just bring God into the conversation. The whole thing's avoided, right? But what's the point? The point of Genesis 3 is there is no God in the conversation. Because what are they thinking of? What's the center of their thoughts in their heart? Themselves. Now, lest you think that arrogance is the only form of pride that can result from somebody squeezing God from the center of their thoughts, let's go to the story of Moses, right? You know the story of Moses. Moses, at one point in his life, was feeling pretty good about himself. He's the prince of Egypt. He's in control of, of a ton of stuff. He's given power, responsibility, right? He's feeling pretty good. And one day he finds out, oh my gosh, I'm a Hebrew. So he thinks, well, I'll lead the Hebrew people. And he's like, I will lead you. And then some guy's being abused. And he's like, I'll kill the oppressor. And he kills the Egyptian and the Jew. The, the Hebrew people are like, we don't want you as our leader. And the Egyptians are like, we don't want you either. And so he like runs away and he's like, no. And he's like 40 years in the desert, like with sheep. And it's terrible, right? And he's down at a low point. He doesn't have a whole lot of self-esteem. And God comes to him and speaks through a burning bush. And this is God's message. I want you to pay attention to this message. This is what the Lord says to Moses. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and with honey, the home of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Mosquito Bites and Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, in this speech that God gives to Moses, who is the center actor in this speech? God, me. I saw my people. I'm going to go get them. You're going to go and talk for me. I want you to see how Moses responds. Five times he responds to God. Pay attention to the center of his concerns. First, he says, but Moses said to God, who, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God's like, well, I called you, so you're Moses. So you'll be my spokesman. So then Moses says, but suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What do I tell them? And God's like, well, if they ask my name, tell them I am that I I am. I am the ever-existing God. I am Yahweh. And then Moses is like, oh, well, what if they don't believe me? And they say that they don't believe me that you sent me. And God's like, uh, okay, if that happens, you see a rod? Throw it on the ground and make crazy stuff happen like a snake. And they'll be like, what? And they'll be like, yeah. <laughs> and then Moses is like, uh, pardon your servant. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken. Your servant, I am slow, a speech and tongue. And God's like, ah. Oh. I'll give you the words to say on a magic teleprompter in your head. Okay, buddy? Uh, I'll just, I'll move through you. You'll have the words. Don't worry. Just open your mouth and it'll come out. It'll be like you and me together and we'll finish each other's sandwiches. It'll be great. And then Moses says, pardon your servant, lad. Can you send somebody else? He's like a petulant teen. Where's the center of all Moses' objections? Where are they located? on himself. Are they for his people? God's people? Are they, is there any concern about what God's doing or about to do? And God, this is my, <laughs> and what happens right after these five, five objections, this is what happens. This is next, then the Lord's anger burns against Moses. God's like, I am trying to lead an oppressed people to freedom. Would you get out of your small self, you sheep herder, and just rescue them? I'm God. I made a bush burn for an hour. <laughs> Come on. God is mad because God opposes the proud. And where are Moses' thoughts? On himself only, not on God. His plan, his heart, his vision, his dreams. What if they don't believe me? I'm God. I'll make something happen. Moses is preoccupied. Now, let me give you a good example. 
There's just some bad examples, right? <sighs> Who do you think I'm going to choose? Who do you think I'm going to choose for a good example? Jesus! That's always the answer. It's always Jesus. Always Jesus. In Matthew 4, right after he gets baptized by John the Baptist, the Lord descends, he's led out to a temptation, similar to the temptation in the garden. But I want to show you how Jesus responds. I think you'll see a difference. So first temptation, Satan, the tempter, comes out and says, hey man, you're hungry, huh? You haven't eaten in like 40 days, right? It's not wrong to eat bread. Why don't you just eat some bread? Come on. You got needs? You got physical needs? You got stuff that needs to happen? You got a body, don't you? You got to listen to it. It's been 40 days. Come on, eat some bread. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. And he quotes Deuteronomy and he says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the tempter's like, all right, all right, all right. So you want to be great, right? So why don't you go to the top of the temple and just jump off? God's going to protect you. You're his son. You're the Messiah. Come on. It'll be like a fun trick. You'll amaze everyone. And Jesus is like, yeah, I could do that. I could jump off, but I'm not in the driver's seat. I don't tell God what to do. He tells me what to do. It's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. I'm not in charge here. And then finally... In the final temptation, Satan takes him to the top of the world and shows him all the world, all the kingdoms. Maybe he showed him all the brokenness. Maybe he showed him history. Look how messed up this world is. Look what humans are going to do. Look at the wars, the famines, the oppression, the injustice. Look what humans are going to do when they're in charge. Look at the awful rulers. Look at the selfish, manipulative, authoritarian. Look at the Holocaust. You can stop it all. Just be emperor. Just be supreme allied commander of the world. Just put yourself in charge of the whole world. You have the power to do it. All you have to do is bow down to me. There's a way to get power. You don't have to go through the cross. Jesus says, away from me, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Each time, Satan tries to get Jesus to think about Jesus. What you need, what you want, what could be good for you. And each time, doggedly, with instant insistence, Jesus says, no, I'm not the center of my thoughts. My Father is. I don't do what I want. I submit to the Father. I do the will of the one who sent me. My thoughts are centered on God. My heart is centered on God. I do what the Lord wants me to do. His desires are my desires, and I don't do anything unless he tells me to do it. My thoughts are centered on God. This is the example. This is what Jesus models for us. This is the opposite of pride. This is the humble servant. Now, this is where it gets uncomfortable. Because I'm not just preaching to you, right? See, when you preach messages like this about forgetting the Lord, not putting him front and center of everything, there's a lot of room for conviction. This is for me, too. I did not choose this sermon. Thanks, Scott. But this is for me. So I started thinking. What are my dysfunctions? I, shouldn't have sh I should have shared this up front. Actually, I'm glad I didn't because you wouldn't have listened to me. But the point is, here's some dysfunctions that I have and how they re relate. These are just the ones I'm willing to share, just so you know. <clears throat> I just seen this humble brag thing where I'm like, oh, the other day I was watching TV. I hardly ever watch TV, but I was watching and I saw this interesting thing. And why I throw that in? Why did I say that? Because I don't want you thinking I watch TV all the time. The other day I was in my fourth hour of prayer in the morning and the Lord spoke to me. I want you to think good of me. I'll tell stories that make me look good. Ha! <laughs> oh, you're so funny. I want you to think well of me. So I throw a little stuff in. The other day I was reading an article in the Atlantic. Why did I put that? Because the Atlantic sounds like a smart person's magazine periodical. I use the word periodical so you think I'm smart. I was in the dentist, all right, and I had nothing to read. 
uh, for a long time, I socially climbed. I would only affix myself to people who could get me up, 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 advance, right? I believed that the world was like the stock exchange, and I only affixed myself to companies that were going up toward an IPO. How's that, pride? Well, if I concern myself mostly with what you think, then who am I not concerned? I'm not concerned about what God thinks of me. You see, and if I'm only affixing myself to people who can help me go up and to the right, who are good for my image or whatever, I'm ignoring humans who God has made in their image. And that's hugely disrespectful. Or how about this judging others? I'm awesome at this. Seriously. I know exactly how other people should live their lives, and I have strong opinions about it. And I'd be better at it, living their life. And if they do something I don't like, mm, I'll let them know with a little, I disapprove. See, what am I doing there? I'm assuming I know all about their story more than God. I, I'm, I'm assuming that I can run their life better than they can. I'm assuming God's not active and involved. See? Who's just the center of my thoughts when I judge people? It's, it's me, my opinion of them, not God's opinion of them. Oh, servant, this is gonna, this, this one, this is new, or not new, it's, it's old, but it's new to me as I was going through this. I'm a great servant when people notice and applaud me for it. But when you treat me like a servant, I get mad. It's like, hey, 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 I didn't do all this work so that you would treat me like a servant. But see, the measure of whether or not you're a good servant is how you respond when somebody treats you like a servant. And I'm like, man, I deserve props. Look at all this work I did. I should get a medal. Not a big one, a small one, just a little one. But if it goes unnoticed, now I'm not saying that we shouldn't thank each other for the work we do, but that's really not the motivation. But boy, it is my motivation. So when you treat me like a servant, I get mad. Forgetting, of course, that the one I serve was a servant. Right? Who am I thinking about when I'm mad? I don't get props or thanks. Or, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You did the dishes. Seriously, here's a plaque, <laughs> you know? Ha, 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 ha. And then this one, anxiety and worry. Anybody here worry? Anybody here a worrier? You're afraid to raise your hand. I get it. That was a joke, see? Uh, there's some people who just don't worry, right? They're just Bobby McFerrin, right? You know, don't worry, be happy. But then there's other of us who, like, anybody else, like, just worry about stupid stuff? Like, I, I shouldn't admit this. So they had communion over here, and I looked up at that giant cross, and I'm like, I am not taking communion at that side of the table because that thing will fall on crush me, and I will die because I don't know what is hung, how that is. I'm going to go over here <laughs> where that looks safe. That's just drapery. <laughs> That's stupid, right? I mean, stupid worries, right? But there's big stuff too, like if you're a parent, you worry about your kids or the economy, your job. There's all sorts of things to be really worried about. But anxiety and worry... I think are disrespectful to God because who's in the... See, here's what I learned about... I have a pretty active imagination and I can imagine all sorts of horrible things happening. But every single time I have one of those daydreams of awfulness, you know what's always the case? I'm always alone and God's never with me. I bet it's the same for you. If you really looked at it, every single one of your worries, every single one of your giant anxieties, the big and the small, God's nowhere near. He's not helping you. He's not there with you. Do you know why? Because God does not inhabit fantasy. He's real, and he only goes with real things. I forget that God is in the center of the universe and he is actively at work and he can make my mistakes and he can weave and bob and make sure things happen and he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I forget that when Jesus says, don't worry, I think I know better. And when Paul says, be anxious about no thing, I think that Paul was crazy. And I forget. See, it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. 
Those are just some examples. And that was just in one week. So I'm looking forward to finding out all the ways that I messed up. So how do you switch? Let's, we gotta get out of this, I gotta get out of this. We gotta get, gotta land this thing. All right, how do we, oh, well, this is our default setting as humans, so good luck, see you later. <laughs> right, this is the default setting of the human heart, to forget about God, right, that we drift. We're like helium balloons from the dollar store, right? We just leak. <laughs> Thank you. So how do we, how do, how do we fix this, how, right, right? How do we do this? Paul has some advice. Hebrews 12, actually, the writers of Hebrews, we don't know who it is. I don't know who it was, but she was smart. That was a joke. All right, I'm going to get angry letters. All right, here we go. And we don't know who the writers of Hebrews was, but it says, now let us run with perseverance that race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. See, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, perspective comes, right? If our thoughts are always centered, then we need to create space in our lives for Jesus to be fixed in our minds. The author of the psalm says, I meditate on your word day and night. Meditate, think deeply, pause, breathe, think. Create space for Jesus to infiltrate your dreams, your ideas, your visions, your thoughts, your opinions, your reactions, all of it. Right in the center of it. Why should we do that? For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand at the throne of God. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Why did Jesus do that? Because his father had something. And let me show you a bar graph. Let me show you a graphical representation of what God's mind and thoughts are set on. That's what gets you. Why did Jesus do what he did? Because he wanted to bring God's children home. Why did he want to bring God's children home? Because that's what God wanted most. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes will not perish but live with God forever. That's what God wants. He wants you. He wants me. He wants us in right relationship. We are at the center of God's heart and always have been, and that's why Jesus came and did what he did. For the joy set before him, Christ scorned the cross and endured it. Why would Jesus endure that cross? Because of you. Because of me. As the band comes up and as we get ready to sing a couple of songs, it's my prayer that you will really, as a group, just reflect on this. Because the more that we understand how well we've been loved, the more we can love in return. The more we realize how much God's heart has been transfixed on us, the more we can transfix our hearts back on him. In the words of the prophet Ezekiel, take our heart of stone that beats only for itself and give me instead a heart of flesh. Or put another way, the old creation is gone. You know, the one that only thinks about itself and a new creation has come. That's my prayer. That's my wish. That's my heart. That's my desire. And I know it's some of yours too. And the only way to get around this is just to say, God, I need help. I focus on myself, on my rights, on what I want. And yet, you did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied yourself and became a slave. A slave, even a slave unto the cross. You didn't consider your rights. You didn't consider what you wanted. You considered me. May I do the same? But I'm not there. Would you help me? Would you take my heart of stone and give me instead a heart of flesh? Would you help me see you well? Would you help me fix my eyes upon you? the author and perfecter of our faith. Because it was for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. That's how pride gets slain. Would you pray with me as we close?
Heavenly Father, Jesus, I'm sorry for all the times I've been preoccupied with myself. And we're sorry for all the times when you have not been the center of our thoughts in any way. Would you please do a good work? Would you please not leave us to ourselves? Would you please fulfill the promise that you will complete the good work which you have begun in us, for which you bought us with the price tag of your blood? Would you do that? And would you change us into people whose hearts and minds are set on you? And if we don't want to give our hearts away, God, we just give you permission just to come and storm the gates of our heart and take it anyway because it's what we want. We give you permission. We love you. Amen.